All right, we're gonna get started. Hello everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. My name is Heidi, and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator at Politics and Prose. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I have the pleasure of introducing our event this afternoon, and I am delighted to welcome authors, Laura Elliott and Leslie Connor. You can click the link that we will drop into the chat to get your own copy of Laura's new book, Storm Dog. Uh, we have some very cool book plates. They're so awesome to go That's along fun. with the book <laughs> while supplies last. Uh, you can also order copies of Leslie's books by clicking on the link in the chat as well. If you have questions for our guests, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of the chat, our guests will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also upvote the questions you like and want most answered. Now onto the event that you're waiting for. Laura Elliott, who writes under the name L.M. Elliott, was a Washington-based magazine journalist covering women's issues and the arts before becoming a New York Times bestselling novelist. Her books explore a variety of time periods, including World War II, the Cold War, and the American Revolution, and have won a number of national awards. Laura holds a BA from Wake Forest University and a master's in journalism from UNC Chapel Hill. She's a lifelong Virginia resident and a history lover and a dog lover. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie Connor is the author of several award-winning books for children, including two ALA Schneider Family Book Award winners, Waiting for Normal and The Truth is Told by Mason Buttle, which was also selected as a National Book Award finalist. Her other books include All Rise for the Honorable Perry T. Cook, Crunch, and her newest book, A Home for Goddesses and Dogs. She lives in the Connecticut woods with her family and her three rescue dogs. And now it is my pleasure to turn the event over to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Well, Laura, we're here to talk about Storm Dog. And, wait, and <laughs> goddesses. A little bit about goddesses and dogs, um, for goddesses and dogs. Laura and I have the great, um, great pleasure of, of finding ourselves um, connected in several ways right now. And one is we share a fabulous editor and a wonderful publishing house at HarperCollins. We have uh, Catherine, Te we both work under Catherine Teagan Books. Um, we, and we happen to have, we, we both own rescue dogs and we both happen to have dog books this year, <laughs> girl and dog books, as a matter of fact. And so, Laura, why don't we start off by having you tell us a little bit about what Storm Dog's about? Thank you. And thank you so much, Leslie, for doing this. And thanks again to Politics and Prose. They've been there, such the mecca of literary discussion at Washington, in Washington. And I'm just so grateful for their having us today. So thank you so much. This is talking about Storm Dog. Um, this is kind of an unusual book for me in that it's not, oh, thank you, Leslie. You could be my, my Vanna White, my yeah. Vanna White, right? <laughs> yeah. um, it's unusual book for me in that it's not a historical or biographical fiction, which is what I've tended to do. You all may know me um, for Hamilton and Peggy or Under a War-Torn Sky. It's contemporary. It's first person uh, narrated by a slightly quirky, whip smart, misfit named Ariel, who has to be able to find, um, who's trying to find her self definition and her sense of belonging. And during the course of the novel, we'll do that through uh, nature, music, um, her own creativity, friendship with an Afghanistan war veteran, a lost dog dog dancing, which yes, is a thing, the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival Parade, and what she calls a storm child crazy plan to crash the parade with a bunch of dancing dogs. Um, it's um, whimsical, it's a little quirky. Um, it's Ariel's journey is definitely a celebration of individuality, um, self-expression, creative partnership, um, empathy, and differing definitions of beauty. Um, and of course, the joy of having a dog's love. And just to set up this conversation, basically what happens in the book is that Ariel, as I said, she's kind of a misfit. She doesn't really fit into her family. She's incredibly well-read. She's a little sassy. She's definitely philosophical. Um, and uh, her family doesn't, she doesn't really fit in. Her older brother who did love her and really did understand her well has been deployed in Afghanistan. Her daddy hasn't really quite been the same since he's been gone. Her mother is absolutely besotted with um, Ariel's big sister, the glorious Gloria, who's just been chosen to be a princess in the Apple Blossom Festival Parade. 
um, she's had a really bad morning when the phone call has come through announcing that she's become a princess. She's taken that Gloria's become a princess. She takes to the foothills of the Blue Ridge, um, which she is where she finds solace and meaning always. Storm blows up, dog finds her in this wild thunder guster um, storm, takes her to the safety of the cabin where she will meet um, Sergeant Josie and it goes from there. You know, I have had the great pleasure of reading this book even before publication. I got to do a, a blurb for it, which is kind of, it's really been an honor. And one thing I really felt about this book was that I think that it has something for every middle grade reader, and I mean middle grade readers of all ages, because as we know, we are we are many and we are, we, are, we are over 11 in some cases. But, um, you know, I, I think that the, that the target audience um, is definitely going to enjoy this. And one thing I was thinking about is the way that young readers, um, young audiences always ask me where ideas come from. And my genre and this genre being realistic fiction, the, the answer is that my ideas come from nonfiction, some element of nonfiction, something from real life, you know, a um, oh, sometimes it's a documentary I've seen, sometimes it's a newspaper article, sometimes it's a story someone told me or something I've seen with my own eyes. Um, and I think what happens is some little seed idea sticks to me, and maybe it's the same for you, Laura. And it's it, what it ends up being is the thing I can't ignore. Right. <laughs> and so I wondered if you could tell us what inspired you to write Storm Dog. Well, I really wasn't looking for it. As you're describing, I wasn't really looking for the inspiration for a novel when I just happened to read a National Geographic article, just like Ariel does, and saw this article about the um, healing power of dance. And within that was a photo essay and a gorgeous photograph of this lady pirouetting with this gorgeous golden retriever with this caption that said canine musical freestyle. And I thought, what? Dog dancing? I've never heard of that. You know, so it, I became quite interested in trying to find a way to write about that, among other things. So I, that sounds like the the little idea that stuck when the minute you said, what's that? You know, I think that that's really interesting. So and so I have another question for you. Um, the other thing that young readers always seem to be interested in is whether we always knew we wanted to be authors from, you know, from a young age or, you know, later, did it come later on? Are you surprised that you're an author now? And I feel like you had an interesting segue into becoming a writer of fiction. And I thought you could tell us about that. Um, I am a journalist by training, as you know, which is why you're so kindly asking about that. I was a senior writer with the Washingtonian Magazine in DC for 20 years um, before taking what I thought was going to be a temporary, potentially a temporary sidestep into writing fiction. Um, and thanks to Catherine Teagan, um, who had faith in me on this one particular story. I, I, I have been here for 20 years now. <laughs> so, um, so with the, um, while I was working with the Washingtonian, I tended to do what we call human interest stories, which are kind of long narratives, um, eight to 10,000 word stories that were often, a, you know, a month in the life of somebody uh, where I would follow people around and write these narratives. And I wrote a lot about um, women's issues, um, mental health pieces, uh, health pieces, the performing arts. Um, and uh, I, I would write these things in scenes, um, which are very much like the narrative, looking for revealing details, right, that we do in um, fiction. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I've been writing a long time now. Um, that style of writing in journalism was pioneered by Truman Capote in, in Cold Blood and now has morphed into a much more um, poetic sounding creative nonfiction, which you can get your MFAs in. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, that whole kind of mindset and having done a lot of those stories for a long time and all the way back to you're asking back to childhood, I was writing for student newspapers starting in fifth grade and always, you know, all the way through and did a lot of stringing for um, professional newspapers when I was down in North Carolina in colleges. Um, and that really teaches you to spot a story, something that hasn't been told before or a hole in coverage, you know? So, I and all those that. things really fit that. <laughs> I love that spot a story. I think that that's something that we all kind of experiment with. And sometimes 
sometimes we might not be quite right about about when we spot a story. You know, some of them don't necessarily pan out to be right. the things that we thought they were, but certainly, certainly this one did. And it also, you know, I mean, I know that you are a very deft researcher and a thorough researcher. Um, and I, but I wondered, you know, how much did you know about something like military working dogs before you started this, and how did you go about finding out more? Well, I actually positioned my computer so that I could show you, for instance, talking about research, these top four shelves, that's all the books that I read just for Peggy. I think there are 87 of them, but that's what I normally do. I do all this research and absorb all this information. Now for Storm, and I love this, you guys, this is a treasure hunt. This is the fun part. Um, so, but with Storm Dog, um, I didn't have that kind of historical data and facts that I really needed to dig into. I did, um, part of what kind of made the story evolve and grow and grow and grow. The thing about journalism, like with the dog dancing before, I probably would have found, done a profile of a dog trainer and followed her and her dog. Um, and by the way, if you go to my website, there is a video of an interview I did with a woman in North Carolina who will show you how Ambrose can be taught to dance, um, which is great fun. But the thing is, is that with the journalism, you know, you can have these really pinpointed um, windows into people's lives, but you can't necessarily expand it into all the wonderful kind of metaphors and symbolic and larger issues, you know, the way you and I can and blessed to do in fiction. Um, so I didn't want to just write about dog dancing. I had done a lot of military, I'd done a lot of um, stories about military families. And again, having done a lot of mental health, had done stuff on PTSD. Um, so I, it made me wonder, and I had done a lot of reading around the same time about um, military working dogs after there was a dog named Cairo who went on the Osama bin Laden raid. These dogs are so incredibly trained and loyal and brave. They were literally willingly parachuted out of a plane strapped to their handlers, um, you know, to go on these missions. So it made me start wondering about what it would be like for these military working dogs or the canine handlers, the people who train them and take them, you know, the dog sniffers to look for IEDs and that kind of thing. What would it be like? What would reentry to the States be like for them um, mm -hmm. to kind of broaden the story of Ariel? Um, and I realized that potentially the most potent and poignant way that I could really talk about this kind of camaraderie and also the, you know, the glories of creative collaboration was having a troubled girl kind of trying, and I know you're nodding because you do this so well with your work, Leslie, you know, um, finding her way um, through a dog and then to augment that with a friendship with a veteran who has also been slightly traumatized and is going to be, you know, helped by this dog coming into their lives. Right, right. It always, I mean, the, the, the seed idea needs characters to drive it uh, every yes. time, I think. And that, that's what you've done so beautifully. And so that's the part about the dog. And I hope you all caught that on her website. You can see dog dancing. Yeah, that's please do so. It's so cool. Can um, you, talk, you should talk a little bit about how you did this with goddesses and dogs too, though, because and how you came to write that. Right. Well, I will. Yeah. Okay. I can tell you that now, I guess. Um, <laughs> You know, we'll for me, what's funny is that, you know, I said it begins with some element of nonfiction. And for me, the element of nonfiction was, a, you know, a big yellow dog who was difficult and who happened to come to my house to live. And so we had this new animal with us. And, you know, um, he was, he talk about quirks, you know, he was not a mean bone in his body, but he, um, he didn't feel good about himself is what we always joke. You know, he was skittish. He didn't have very much confidence as a dog. He was afraid of a lot of things. And we, you know, I, what happened for me, I guess the writer in me got me going on this, but I began to kind of keep a little diary on him because we were trying to guess at his backstory. You know, we were trying to guess what had happened to him in his past. There was nobody who could tell us that, least of all the dog. Right. And so I realized, oh my gosh, you know, here I am like making up his history. History, and I thought, which is exactly what I do when I create backstory for a character. And so, so my story began, you know, with a real dog who was really just right under my nose, who I could, who I could study, did not have a back, you know, a military background or anything. Lord only knows what he had for a background. Um, but, you know, there were certain things that would come forward, like we discovered he was afraid of things with wheels. And so we, we sort of, at first we thought it was bicycles. And then later on, it became a little bit clearer that it was actually motorcycles, but that bicycles maybe were close 
close enough to motorcycles to also be scary to this dog, you know? Um, and so then, you know, my, the next part of my question, and I mean, for both of us, we brought girl to meet dog. And um, I think that, you know, I wondered for you how your own interests kind of informed the character of Ariel who came, you know, who came in contact with this dog and, well, it's funny, again, I didn't have the, I, I couldn't do all my research, right? I had to pull into my kind of my own, it, it really became kind of an amalgamation. I always use this word with kids. If you've got students out there, amalgamation, right? Is what does it mean? It means that you're taking many different el you know, elements and making something brand new, which is what you do a lot with writing. Um, so I, there are a lot of elements of my own life that have come in or informed the backstory of these characters. I will uh, tell you that my first love actually was music. I, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a concert flautist or a symphony orchestra conductor. I did march in the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Parade in high school with my marching band. Um, when I went to college, I was the field conductor or drum major of my university's um, marching band. Yep, I thought I was going to speak the world for Tchaikovsky. Um, <laughs> um, and so I really believe in one of the permeate, one of the themes that really permeates all of this is the kind of incantational power of music to elevate us. Um, uh, Ariel's big brother, George, who's one of my I loved writing him. Uh, he is, he's, he's one of the cool musicians, you know, saxophone player, drum major in high school, heartthrob. Um, and so he says to her that music should be an outcry from the soul. And he quotes Thoreau who said that, um, when I hear music, I fear nothing, I am invulnerable. And so I hope that that really kind of, I, I am a true believer in, in those kinds of things. So that definitely, you can see music is really an important thing in this novel. Um, I, I also, um, uh, I do, all my dogs, I guess I'll just go ahead talking about dogs and and um, yeah. the other kind of influences in my life, but music was- Right, yeah, I mean, the themes kind of evolve and I know that they're very personal to you. So that's, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I have, as I said, I always had rescue dogs. I can introduce my dog who's sleeping on the floor in a minute. She's my ninth rescue, I think. Her name's Gracie, oh. I'll show you in a minute. Um, I never taught a dog to dance, um, <laughs> and, but, but my daughter, and I grew up in this world, in Ariel's world. I've lived here most of my life um, in this, these kind of environments. My um, daughter was a, is a champion equestrian. She was an eventer, um, which means that for those of you who ride, she does their three different components to eventing. It's cross country stadium jumping and dressage. And it's a sport that you really, I, I marveled watching her, the symbiosis and the creative collaboration that had to happen with that animal. When you, and especially cross country, because I have to tell you, I would go <gasps> over every of those five foot jumps that she was taking is that you really, she had to know that animal well. They had to trust one another. She had to respect what that horse could do and want it to, to do. They did it together. It was truly a partnership. And some of her, and that sense of accomplishment and love between those two was just palpable. She had some compatriots in Pony Club who also did musical freestyle in dressage. So I had witnessed these six, these girls, these teenage girls trained 1600 pound animals to sashay and turn to music. So they could take all of that and kind of transpose it to the idea of a, you know, a dog and a girl um, dancing. You know, it's one of the things that I always tell kids um, who want to write nothing's wasted in your life, right? If you have your antenna up and you're listening and you're watching and you're absorbing, um, in the journalism world, we call it saving string. You get a little piece of this conversation, a little bit of that person in that situation, you keep tucking it in your pocket and eventually you're gonna have a big tall ball of twine to write a story with, so. I am definitely gonna adopt that. I, I sometimes talk less gracefully about sort of a funnel over my head that that things seem to drop into and then pour down a story and arrange themselves, you know, oh, these little things that are there for me to use. It just feels so magical. And I'm sure it's the same way as that yes. ball of string that builds over time, you know? Um, you know, I wanted to just um, swing back to um, the point about, um, about place, the sense of place here. Um, I feel like um, setting really comes through in a strong way. And I know that's because of your personal relationship with the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I wondered if you could, you know, talk a little bit more about that because 
talk about the taste of Virginia. It's just here. And I, obviously, if you were the drum major, you and, and I, you know, I can imagine you feeling that, you know, right on through your very core, you know. So oh. will you tell us a little bit more about maybe about about sense of place and setting? Yeah. Yes, and I'll just say as an aside, you know, to all, all the kids out there who are missing their school bands, I, I'm so sorry that you're not having that communion right now because there is nothing yeah. like playing together, you know, and that kind of give and take, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, you know, it's interesting in my historical and biographical novels, the, the time of the era of the novel presents me all sorts of conundrums and challenges and affects the choices that my protagonists have to make. Um, in this novel, it really had a, had a lot to do with setting. And there are two kind of strong thematic things that came through um, as I was writing. I planned it a little bit, but I have to be honest, it was a little bit more organic and it evolved as I was writing. The first one is that, um, you know, I, I worry that we are losing the sense of nature and I, not you, you're out there in that beautiful, yeah. you know, writer's cabin. <laughs> But, you know, so many, so many teenagers don't have that joy. Um, Ariel really finds her solace and, you know, meaning in life and kind of an affinity with the world when she goes out into nature and feels the winds. And um, she finds her sense of um, divinity or fate, you know, however you all want to call it in things like, you know, a spring beauty's little intricate um, design or in a catbird song um, that's force of creativity, that force of life, you know, she really feels in the setting and which allowed me to do other kinds of um, themes that I wanted to, which is about, you know, beauty, our concepts of beauty. Let's, let's expand those a little bit, you know, to not necessarily be traditional ones. Um, and the catbird was a great metaphor for it because it's all gray, right? But mm -hmm. talk about a bodacious jazz musician, the catbird in, in its improvisational song is just an extraordinary musician in and of itself. And she actually says, um, you'd completely miss that dull looking all gray catbird's improvisational magic if all you thought about was his appearance. Right. So there's that that happens in nature. And then in Virginia, where I live in that kind of northwest corner of the state, um, it's a really interesting it's it's such a almost like melting pot. It's so representative of the country as a whole in many ways within the 50 miles of her um, world. You have, you know, the very uh, diverse and international Washington DC area, which spills into, you know, the suburbs, which spills into the exurbs where you have all these multi-million dollar track homes and these luxury designer um, shopping meccas that then spill into, um, you know, an area that's just trying to remain rural. It has lots of horse farms and, you know, 19th century country estates where people are still riding to the hounds chasing foxes over, you know, family owned farms where people are struggling to survive and um, their crops and their orchards might be picked by immigrants or migrant workers. You know, you've got all that all together, which gives it a wonderful um, mixture of influences and thoughts. It also, however, sets up some, you know, frictions that are born of stereotypical thinking, right? right. Yes. And as I was writing this novel, you know, there was a lot of conversation about the polarization going on in our country, and there it is in Ariel's world. Um, and I, you know, it, it became important to me to be able to really show that one of my favorite um, characters actually is Marcus, minor characters, who is the big sister's beau, um, mm -hmm. who is the son of a reformed alcoholic, evangelical, um, piccolo playing revolutionary war reenactor, um, mm -hmm. who's going to save the day at one point during the parade. And Marcus can quote Patsy Klein scripture and Roman philosophers he's reading. And he is saving up as much as he can, working odd jobs, handyman jobs, wearing a pizza slice to dance on the street corner for a pizza you know, parlor and shoveling manure at a dog pound to go to community college, that's his dream. And Ariel by accident, which actually leads into a lovely quote I wanna ask you about from your book. Um, by accident, she makes a comment about his manners and she means it as a compliment, but it's, you know, it's born out of the stereotypical thinking. Right. And he says to her, 
uh, think because I'm born in a trailer that, you know, not some fancy house like yours that I can't have good manners, you know? Yeah. I love the one of your quotes from um, Goddesses that misguided isn't quite the same thing as cruel. It's a That's very right. profound. Yeah. In reference to something that happens to um, some little farm animals, right. um, there's a, you know, it, it's a bit of a mystery thread through the book that we don't know exactly, you know, how they met with a horrible fate. It's a couple of little goats who have been um, um, mutilated, I guess you could say. It just sa sounds ho absolutely horrible and it is pretty horrible. But um, it so yeah, dead. I did think that, you know, we, I mean, yeah, people need the benefit of our doubt and we need, we also need, you know, to try to think from things from their perspective and know that people do get in over their heads on things. And um, I thought that Marcus's character added a lot to your story. And I also love that Ariel had this great relationship with him in spite of the fact that she doesn't have a great relationship with her sister, you know, who I saw the bird for me was a metaphor for, for that as well. I mean, yes. to me, Ariel is the bird, you know, yes. She, she may not be as much to look at as Gloria, but, yeah. <laughs> but, she, but, uh, but when you meet the sister uh, readers, you will love her, <laughs> you know, but you, know, you will love to hate her. <laughs> yes, yeah, she yeah. was easy to write, Leslie, I you yeah. know. <laughs> I know some characters you kind of can't wait to get to because you just know you're going to breeze through them because you can see them, you know, so live and in front of you, which is really kind of, you know, kind of wonderful, but yeah, but you, and you I, know, I, I, I I'm sorry. You're frozen. I know. I think I have a little technical glitch there. So sorry. No, go ahead. What go ahead. I was going to say that we've come, we've come to to about 25 minutes in, and I was thinking that we should see if we want to, you know, if we can open it up. If um, if any of the participants today have some questions for you about Storm Dog, and if not, they'll just have to hear me ask more questions. <laughs> so, Heidi's going to come on back. There she is. Hi, hey, Heidi. That was lovely. Thank you so much. We can talk all afternoon. <laughs> I know. I'm talking about to Virginia now, <laughs> be in the countryside. Yeah, y'all. If you can go to school Sky Meadows State Park. It is this beautiful, beautiful sweep of land where you can just see for miles and miles. And I promise you, you'll feel your heart lift and you can go walk up right up onto the Appalachian Mountains and you can see where Sergeant Josie is in that thunderstorm. Uh, nice. <laughs> well, someone wasn't one of the questions. That's a great segue. One of the questions was, you know, do you you, you write with such a great sense of place? Was there um, was there a place that you went to that inspired your writing? But it sounds like that is probably where you went well, right there <laughs> that's one of my favorite places in the world to go and and I did I, I forgive me if I'm repeating myself I did grow up in Fairfax County she's the counties that I'm writing about a folk year and uh I will say you know there's a wonderful narration of of the novel that you all might want to listen to but she doesn't it's folk here y'all anyway <laughs> here in, in Clark counties which is right on one county on one side of the Blue Ridge and the other county on the other which is the divide between the, the kind of country gentry and the harder working folk who have family lands um I grew up in Fairfax County which is a little bit closer but it, I I was saying before in Fairfax County I grew up on what had been my granddaddy's dairy farm so and that's the way it used to be so i have loved this area i love the hills i love the views i love the people yeah i guess it really came through in this yeah absolutely it was a real joy to write um but please go to the person who asked the question go to sky meadow state park i promise you will fall in love <laughs> beautiful thank you uh, we have a question from Aaron. Aaron is asking, will you both please talk a bit about your revision process once you've written your first draft? Any tips or techniques that work especially well for you? This is so funny because Laura and I think that perhaps our editor is listening in today. And so um, I don't know if <laughs> she even knows the things that that maybe we go through. Um, I think for she me, saves us. <laughs> she saves saved us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's in the process of saving me right now. I happen to know she's reading something that I turned in very recently. So um, I think, you know, yeah, for me, process, you know, it, usually the story kind of begins to come in in bits and scenes. And I always, I often think I don't really write stories, I write scenes. And then I have to figure out how to connect them. And I am not an author who works with a, um, with a, you know, a 
really tight, tight format. I don't make an outline and then stick to it. Um, I'm, I'm an organic mess, really. And I always say that my brain must be shaped like a starfish for the way that things kind of come to it and, and go away from it. So I end up with kind of a lot to do at the end. And yet, I usually have gone back through each scene and kind of combed it and combed it and combed it. I'm also an author who doesn't ever, who doesn't always start with what comes next. I'm not chronological. In, and I'll, if I, if I, if I try to be chronological, I could get stuck for a very long time not knowing what scene comes next so I'll move on ahead or backwards to a scene I do know and you'd be surprised how things can grow from there and inform each other from there so I always say I have this writing process that I don't recommend to anybody but and yet you know and yet it is the one that works for me so um you know that, that's that's me but I have a feeling Laura is more structured uh Yes, to a point, but it's but it's because it's a journalism background, you know, it really is just from having to had to have worked on really tight deadlines that I could not miss. And having written like a 10,000 word story where the editors might come to me, sorry, we've got to take two columns out of this now, and having to go through and like count through, okay, there's a widow, there's a, you know, I'm pulling things out, like being able to pull a 1000 words out of a story in an hour on deadline. Yeah. So um, there are two things I usually say to kids when I'm talking to schools that, it, that help me a lot. Um, first off, I mean, I do all this research. The hardest part for me is to stop the research because yeah. there's 87 books. There are about 5,000 books I could write from this, y'all. <laughs> just so many interesting tangents. Um, as Catherine, if she's listening, will say, yes, that's the problem. Anyway, um, <laughs> so that's fascinating to me. Um, so I tend to have a, a sequential outline given events that I know that I want to include that are historical facts that I need within my characters. That being said, um, I always tell students, if you can, to always have a beginning and an end. If you've got your beginning and you know you, it needs to be strong and you know your ending and where you're going to go, then you don't have to have a really strict outline. You Stepping stones, think about crossing a creek. How are you going to get from one side to the other? If you can do that, you won't get lost. Mm -hmm. um, my revision, one of the things that I do, and I think it goes back to my music background, I read what I've written out loud mm -hmm. because words have a, a pitch and a rhythm and a, you know, and, a, and a fluidity to them. If I'm reading it out loud and I don't feel a cadence and I trip on things, I know I need to fix it. Yeah, right. right. And that's one of the things that my critique group, who met some of the members are here today for the webinar, my members of my critique group, um, we, we meet every, every week now via Zoom, and um, we do read out loud, and I think that that ear is so important to the writing, and I, you know, they and I ferret out a lot of trouble, you know, in that phase. Mm -hmm. So it's, they're yeah. my first listeners. It's really good. Yeah, I wanted to ask if that was something that either of you have ever used or if you see the benefit of a writing group. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Would not be here without him. <laughs> I, you know, I don't have a writing group, but I do. I have two adult creative artists, professionals, and they are my first readers mm -hmm. and editors before I get to Catherine. And they have, they are, it's, it's a really kind of glorious thing to share that because they share what they're working on with me too. It's, nice. it's lovely. So they're my, they're my, they're my group. Nice. Terrific. Great. Uh, the next question is from Daisy. She asks, how do you change gears between writing historical fiction and contemporary fiction? I had a hard time doing it to be completely honest. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, but, you know, again, it, it helps. Here's the thing, actually, I would, I would anybody, if Daisy, if you want to be a writer, um, once you know how to write, once you know how to research, once you know how to learn, you can learn anything, you can research anything, and you can write anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it's just a different, there's certain tropes that are going to be in fiction versus, you know, nonfiction or historical versus contemporary. Um, the main thing you have to try to make sure you have in all instances, particularly with historical and with contemporaries, that authenticity. Part of the reason why for historical fiction that I need to read all these is I need to know what they ate, how they dressed, what the weather was like. But I mean, I've literally actually researched the weather on a date that I'm writing about kind of thing. What did their shoes feel like? What did they... You know, and I love little facts like the, the, the um, in Hamilton and Peggy, um, a doctor describes or one of the characters describes how he was saved from a snake bite by the doctor making him drink a, a, a liter of olive oil. 
Isn't that great? <laughs> so, so it's it's a question of, and isn't that great? This is why I get stuck on the research because I keep finding these incredible things. Yeah. And with um, Dimitri's tiger, one of my favorite stories, and there isn't time for it, but maybe we can talk about it another time to talk about a armageria, which is basically a frat party on horseback in 15th century Florence, and it, <laughs> it built an entire um, chapter for me. But the trick is authenticity. You know, I had to make sure that Ariel sounded true to today, you know, and part of the way I saved myself was the musical references and the book references helped me with that. There's a playlist, y'all, on my website, if you go, lmelliot.com. The playlist, there's a reading list. There are these videos. Um, you can learn about Martha Graham and, um, you know, things like that. Nice. Do either of you or both of you listen to music while you write or research? Is that something that's part of your process? I can't listen to anything lyrical while I work. Um, I get too wrapped up in words. And also I, I often, <laughs> in school audiences, I'm often standing there holding my ear while I talk about writing because I really feel like, you know, the, the writing comes in through the ear, which I think is why it's so important to me to read out loud. Um, and so, yeah, the music of the book has to be, the thing that's there. I can sometimes handle, you know, somebody's leaf blower in the background, and things like that, but especially if it doesn't have words to it, you know, and I'll start listening to someone else's words and, you know, inevitably like them better and then feel bad about myself. So <laughs> I have to have it, I have to have it very quiet, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, I can't listen to me. And I think it's because of having been a music major, I was trained to listen for progressions and, you know, compositional tech. And so I, I get, get myself pulled <laughs> over, so no. Right. And, but do you find that every book has a soundtrack? Yes. Yes. And, you know, actually going back to, I'm sorry, I think it was Daisy's question about the authenticity. It's a, one of the ways I really root myself to is, is the music of the time, mm. you know, you know. Yeah. yeah. So I do too. And usually there will be something that becomes kind of the soundtrack of the book, which does do an emotional thing for me, I yeah. think, with, with the title, you know, um, and that used to happen more in my earlier books. I'm not sure that it's happening as much now, but um, but that it was definitely a feature of of my writing earlier on. And there was no reference to the song or anything, but it was just for me. It was when I would think about it, you know. <laughs> that. Maybe yeah. books should come along with playlists like Laura has. For <laughs> you know, it's so much fun because on our website, I love that. Yeah, please go and listen to it. It's all it's all okay. I made sure that you know <laughs> teens can listen to it. There's one I had to leave out actually. It's, it was like darn, but there's anyway. Yeah, it's not there. It's all perfectly fine to listen to. But there's I I when I listen to it, there's a lot of joy in it, and I hope you all get up and dance to it. Yeah. Love it. Let's see, let's go to uh, another question. This is from Victoria. She writes, any chance the college band you referenced referred to was James Madison University nestled in the beautiful Shenandoah Mountains making you a member of the Royal Marching Dukes? No, I'm sorry, but I know JMU. <laughs> I used to drive by it all the time, either with the horse trailer or on my way down to Wake Forest. I went to Wake Forest undergrad. So Demon Deacons, you guys, <laughs> <laughs> very strange name. <laughs> And we have another question from Katie. She asks, were you able to meet some military dogs in when you were doing your research? Uh, no, I wish I had been able to. Um, I have since, um, mm -hmm. and they are a special, special, wow. They are, um, those dogs are so well-trained and are so smart. Mm -hmm. And they say that they can differentiate 400 different smells at once. And they become so protective of their people mm -hmm. and their unit and their handler. They're really kind of extraordinary. I have met, as I said, a lot of rescue dogs. Um, and I just recently, actually, I haven't posted it yet, but I just did an interview with a, a veteran who was willing to talk about his specially trained dog that came through Canine Companions who helps him. He has physical um, disabilities that occurred from wounds that he sustained um, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, we always must thank our veterans for what they do for us. And he, but th his dog also helps him with um, PTSD mm -hmm. issues. So I'll post that probably in about a week if y'all are interested. Yes, that'd be great. 
Um, we have come to the end of our audience Q&A. Um, Leslie, did you have anything you wanted to mention? I think, I think that um, I, I understand that we have some educators and librarians in the audience and I thought I would sort of ask that question for their, you know, um, for them, for their readers. Um, Laura, what, what, is, what do you hope that young readers will take away from your story, um, you know, take away from the reading of Storm Dog? You know, I um, and Leslie and I both talked about this. I, we're both, I'm really acutely aware, and I know Leslie's too, that we're writing for young people. And you know, I tend to write a lot of. It's I, I'm often asked why Ellen Elliott. It's because I started with Under the Corn Sky, thanks to Catherine Teigen, um, which was a fictionalization hugely. Um, it's not my dad's story, but my dad survived World War II, mm -hmm. and um, because of French teenagers helping, he's a B-24 bomber pilot. And so I have three World War II books. I have um, uh, two Revolutionary War books. Um, and I learned very quickly that when you write for teenagers, they want the truth. They do not want it sugarcoated and they do not want to be spoken down to at all. And if you do, you're done, you're toast with them. Um, but what they do want though, is they want this little permeating thread of hope. The wonderful thing about writing for teenagers and after years and years and years of writing for adults and on some pretty difficult topics like domestic violence and sexual assault and things like that, I don't have to deal in nihilism anymore. It's really wonderful. I can always have this little spark of not that, oh, everything's all fine when you end. Boy, do I get, and I asked all the time, why did that character have to die? Why did, because you have a responsibility to be honest, right, with your, but Teenagers have that wonderful idealism still. They want to believe that if they push hard enough, if they stick to their moral compass, if they have integrity and they really think about what's right and wrong, they can make the world a better place. And I hope that um, my stories always offer examples showing rather than telling of choices and what choices kind of help push the, uh, the stone up the mountain as Sisyphus you know, does, right? Mm -hmm. So with this one in particular, I really hope that I, I hope they go away with the idea that individual, I mean, what could be more symbolic of individuality than dog dancing, right? I mean, it's, it, it is unique. <laughs> so I want them to go away with the idea that your voice, what you choose to do is special and that we shouldn't dismiss or ridicule anybody's choices of what they consider is their glorious expression of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, also, I hope very much through the things we were talking about before with you know, the kind of frictions that I was talking about, that we should have empathy and to learn to stand in other people's shoes, to not swallow stereotypical thinking um, or xenophobia or you know, considerations of the other to learn to think for themselves, to make their own choices based on personal experiences or reflection, to learn to think for themselves. Um, I hope that in, this is a light, um, happy and you know, delightful kind of story, but that is also has these kinds of questions um, for them to think about. Because honestly, y'all, there's nothing more redemptive or liberating than tolerance, right? And learning to get along. Um, one of the things and I, I just, I'll also end with this one quote that I really, one of my favorite quotes from Ariel, um, she says, uh, at the end, after she's, you know, managed to do this dog dancing, I don't want to give too much away. She just discovers herself in, in a kind of remarkable way, thanks to this dog and thanks to music and thanks to dancing and thanks to Sergeant Josie and the parade, always march in a parade if you all can, <laughs> she just says, um, now that I can define myself on my own terms a little better, now that I have imagined and created my own melody, people not understanding me or mistakenly, mistakenly labeling me just doesn't hurt as much. I know who I am. And I would wish that for all of us. Such a gift. Yeah, imagination can do that for us, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. That thank you so much for the two of you for being here. It's so nice for you to share your stories and your love of animals. It's just really oh, Gracie, lovely. Come here. <laughs> oh, let's see Gracie. Gracie, Gracie, come here. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> Gracie, come. <laughs> She's not too bigger than you all. 
she, she doesn't want to have her she screen time. Down. Come on. She's tired of Zoom as well. <laughs> She's oh. here. Oh, <laughs> okay. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And thanks to both of you for being here. Thank Leslie, you. For being here. Yes. Leslie, did you have any final words that you wanted to share as well? I'll just go give Storm Dog a try, you know? I think that... <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I think that, you know, dog and animals are, are um, dogs and animals are kind of a universal theme in children's books and universally enjoyed by, by kids. And um, so, you know, I'm hoping that maybe that the draw will be there. And um, I think in both cases, our, our girls and our dogs ended up better for each other. And uh, so that, that's the feel good element. And uh it's true, what Laura says, I think we can cover tough topics as long as we maintain that, that thread of hope. And you'll, I think you'll get that in both our books. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Absolutely. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much for taking the time. This is such fun. Thank you very much. Good, good. thank you for being here. And thank you for the questions. And if you look in the chat box, you can again, see the link to purchase uh, the books by both of our authors here today. You also can follow us on social media and all the information there is in the chat as well. Um, again, thank you both so much for being here. Yeah. <laughs> Sharing your stories and everything. Um, and please everyone uh, keep reading, read widely, read these wonderful books and everybody stay safe. Thank you so thank much you. for being here.